Hi everyone, welcome to Woolen Spinning. Happy New Year. It is January 1st of 2020. I wanna welcome you all and thank you so much for being here. I can't believe we're in episode 132 already. It just seems absolutely crazy to me, but I just wanna check the stream health and make sure that we're up and running and then we have a chocker block show today. So we've got some Ask Anything. Uh, one of our members, Good, we're all running. <clears throat> One of our members in uh, our community, um, in the Ravelry group, she had posted and asked anything that was uh, reflections and what did you learn in 2020? So we're gonna talk about that. Um, quite a few people responded and then we're going to talk about some works in progress. I have a new cast on that I wanted to talk to you guys about. And I have a whole bunch of weaving that I wanted to share with you because I wanted to, my goal was to get the both looms dressed by the end of the year and I was able to get one dressed and the other one is going to be dressed today so that's really exciting uh the chat is already um chocker block full so thank you so much for everybody being here today I know for a lot of people this is a day off um here in Canada it's a statutory holiday um so yeah thank you so much for being here and for taking some time out um of your day <clears throat> oh, thank you. Yes, the earrings are finished. These are the Hello Bargello kit. Um, I had talked about them very briefly a few episodes ago, and I never got a chance to make them. So I was being total copycat of my friend Felicia of Sweet Georgia. I loved hers. She had made hers back in November. And um, I said to her, I'm like, would you be totally um, insulted or, or hurt if I went and ordered the same things. And she was like, no, of course not. She's so great. And, uh, I've made my first pair. I sat on the chair on boxing day morning and, uh, made them. So I've got one pair made and I'm going to make a second pair and I'm going to reverse the colors. So, uh, do the, yeah, I'm going to, I'll reverse the colors. So the Hello Bargello, if you don't know, is by I think her name is Brett and this is what you can order the Rhiannon earrings and you, there's all different colors the kit that I ordered has these colors in it but there's three different colorways um, and you get 100% wool DK or DMC uh, cruel wool so it's just really fun all right for giveaways um, for December, we had a special offer that was going on in the um, in on Patreon. Um, there was a free sock study uh, ebook for everybody for uh, most of the Patreon tiers, and uh, I had I also have available uh, soft cover books, so you can order directly from Blurb and you can order a soft cover of the book. And we had a prompt uh, in the Ravelry group, so this was open to everybody. Um, for this book to be sent to you. So I did random number generator and it actually chose post number 18, which is Ingrid Spin Knit Love. If you could send me your mailing address, Ingrid, I will get this into the mail for you ASAP because I have some other stuff I need to mail out as well. And the prompt was about socks and um, um, your goals around socks, what you enjoy about spinning and knitting socks. And Ingrid said, I've never intentionally spun for socks. I have casted on a pair of socks made out of two ply that I spun about a year ago, but it was simply because I had finally accomplished a fingering weight yarn. I That was my first pair of hand spun hand knit socks actually was just, oh my goodness, I've accomplished a fingering weight, so I'm gonna make socks. Uh, however, the colors were awful, so I frogged. This year, I really want to focus on trying to intentionally spin for a pair of socks. I find hand-knit socks to be some of my most used and loved knitted projects. That's wonderful, uh, Ingrid. So I hope that this is helpful. If you would like to order your own copy, there are links in the show notes for the post associated with this and just follow through to Blurb and you can order your own copy. They are made to order, so they have to print them and there's a, a just a delay of a couple of a day or two. So for January, we've got another bat to give away. It's in these colors, my favorite colors. Um, there's some silken oil in here, some Coriadale, some BFL silk. It was just lots of different stuff. And so if you could go into the January episode thread and if you could tell us what you learned in 2019. And like I said, that is open to everybody. 
just go into the Ravelry group, make sure you're a member of the group and uh, answer the question. And you're looking for the January episode thread and it is linked in the show notes. Show notes are available at patreon.com slash wellforpearls and at wellforpearls.com if you prefer not to go on to Patreon. I have a lot of people to welcome to our Patreon community this past month. There were a lot of new people who signed up, so welcome. Uh, you should have a message from me in your inbox on Patreon. So if you didn't, if you haven't been back on Patreon since you signed up, just go ahead and have a look. So, some information is there. And if you're looking for the index, which is all of the content that we've created over the years at Wool and Spinning, that is linked on the landing page. And if you're having trouble, if you're if you have signed up for a tier that's the Slack channel or higher, just pop into the Slack channel and ask. Somebody will answer you almost immediately. So I think that is everything for sort of our beginning kind of housekeeping stuff. If you're an attentive spinner, please go and answer the doodle that was posted mid-December um, if you would like to participate in Woolen Spinning Radio. Um, there are slots available for the next few weeks to hop on Skype audio only. All you need is a microphone and um, uh, e earbuds. Uh, so you can do it on your phone. Um, it's not difficult. And um, you can hop on to Woolen Spinning Radio with me and maybe one other person if you guys signed up for the same slot. For those who are new and are having trouble with the live chat assistance plea, uh, and need some assistance around getting into the live chat, there is a post that I wrote into, I think it was in November actually, now it's getting to be a while ago. It's linked down below for those who need some help. All right. Oh my gosh, Suzanne is uh, watching the stream, casting on a hat and watching hockey. That's awesome. That's wonderful. So it was so funny. Somebody... Um, Posted, I think it was in the Slack channel. Um, May 20, it was Priscilla. May 2020 be the year of 2020 vision. I loved that. I thought it was so corny, but like so appropriate. Um, yeah, so happy new year, everybody. Everybody's just saying hello. Thank you for the compliments on the earrings. They're, I'm not used to wearing danglies. If you guys notice, I either wear hoops or I wear studs. So it's been fun to wear these. We went to the pantomime on uh, Boxing Day and we... Um, I wore them. It was it, it was kind of, oh yeah, I'm wearing, you know, earrings that are hanging down because I normally don't. So that was kind of fun. All right, let's get into spinning growth, or sorry, into uh, Ask Anything. We'll run the beginning intro for the uh, podcast and then we'll pop right into uh, Ask Anything. So somebody uh, said, oh yeah, earrings that make noise. They totally drive me crazy too. Um, my sweater. This is um, a Hohi Locatelli uh, pattern. It's I think it's opposite pole. It's in my project page. I don't wear it a ton. Um, but I got really super cold this morning. And it's one of the few sweaters. It's at a commercial yarn that I got it. Michael's years ago I think it was like Patton's classic wool or something and um, it's one of the sweaters one of the few sweaters that over the years as I've purged my closet that I always keep there's a couple of things about the sweater that I don't like um, I really like the big collar but the sleeves are a bit like they're meant to be knit straight and you don't do any you don't really do any decreasing and just because of how I like my sweaters, I wish it had either been a three quarter or I don't mind the full length, but just a tiny bit tighter. Um, Cause I find that they just are floppy, but I always get compliments on it when I wear it and I do like it and it fits me really, really well. Um, it's an okay shape for me, but you knit the inside square that's on the back of the sweater and then you pick up around and you knit uh, the outside. So it's um, sort of a circular type um, construction. It's very interesting. 
So welcome to everybody. I'm not going to try to say hi to everybody because there are so many people uh, in the chat and you guys are chitty chatting away. I'm glad that you got in, Elizabeth. Welcome for the first time. Um, sometimes it just takes a bit to kind of get the hang of everything. You know, you get the hang of, of your, uh, how sort of the technology works. So in Ask Anything, Emini, who is a um, one of our, our uh, community members, she's been on Wool and Spinning Radio. So if you haven't listened to that episode, I highly recommend that you go back and listen. She's incredibly inspirational. And actually the grid that's up, that was just up, this one's Becca's, but the one prior is Emini's. Um, she came into the Ask Anything thread, and it is Ask Anything. And generally we get questions around, um, you know, spinning related questions and sort of technical questions, or we get, you know, um, questions around sort of troubleshooting. And, and that's the whole point of the thread, but it is an ask anything thread. You can ask anything. And over the years, we've had people asking questions of the community or people ask questions um, to me directly. Anyway, so she posted, uh, what did you learn in 2019? And then she said, it's a loaded question, right? And then she said, so, and then she shared her grid and she, these are the things that she learned. So I thought we, and then what was so cool about it is she listed the nine things that she learned and then people started responding. So Becca responded, Christina responded, Megan responded. Um, and then uh, later Kat and Rebecca put it up there responses. So I wanted to share from the community because we have such a prolific community when it comes to how much they make and what they make. And I would say that probably 90% that that's not based on any fact, but I would say probably 80 or 90% of the community is multi-craftual. They don't just spin, they weave, they knit, they crochet, they sew, um, they do lots of different things. We've got some scrapbookers. Um, there's lots of other things that people do. And most people came to spinning from something else. So they wanted to weave with their hand spun or they wanted to knit with their hand spun. That's usually the two. The knitting with your hands, their hand spun is usually the gateway. And then eventually they want to start learning to weave because they want to weave with their hand spun. That kind of seems to be the most um, common uh, reasons that people come to spinning. And so, because of that, they end up with a lot of learning, but it's multi-craftual. And then on top of that, in relation to spinning itself, most people in the community do, they spindle spin and they wheel spin, which is really cool. So Emily says what she learned is spinning yarn with a higher silk content where the silk dominated the finished yarn. She made art yarn with the Ashford Jumbo E Spinner. She learned a solid techniques in mastering the wheel, which is Irish tension, which is a whole, like it is a learning curve to use Irish tension. She learned how to support spindle spin and you can see her support spindles in the top corner there, number three, it's just beautiful. Uh, she made a bubble crepe yarn. She spun a round two ply, which I think she did by plying it quite tightly if I remember correctly. Totally conquered beehives. She spun hand dyed Gulf Coast Native. She spun a four ply yarn and she learned that it was okay to spin a two ply. So I think she, um, just based on my conversation with her a couple months ago, I think she, um, uh, Imani tends to spin sort of art yarn or, or three plies um, and she got comfortable just making two plies, which is awesome. So thank you um, Imani for starting this off. This is Becca's. She said she finished her first sweater quantity on the wheel, which was easier than doing the actual knitting. Totally agree. She spun her first thick and thin singles on a wheel, her first yarn on her new acquisition of a Navajo style supported spindle. She helped with a natural dye process for the first time. She spun dorset horn along with many of us. I think that was a first for her. She learned how to do proper tail spinning. Uh, she did hers on one of her heavier spindles and because she didn't want to have to mess with the orifice of a wheel, which totally makes sense since she has quite a collection of spindles. She spun Wensleydale woolen, which she wouldn't normally do, but she really likes the yarn. She finished the Polworth study with multiple skeins of Polworth and Polworth blends. She finished her first cabled yarn, which I think is the one when it flips over in just a minute here, is the one number nine. It's the one that's in the uh, bottom corner there, just beautiful. And looking back, she said she realizes that she tried more things than she sh thought she had, and some were more successful than others, but all very interesting. And she thanks uh, Imani for the uh, prompt. 
Oh, that's interesting, Suzanne. The, the progression for you is crochet to weaving to knitting to spinning. That's so interesting. <laughs> Florence, you're hilarious. Hers, her progression was knit and then spin, 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 spin. <laughs> So I only have photos for Becca and Imani's uh, post, but Christina says, who is Louise at number 47, I have all of the usernames from Ravelry and from the group and the post that it was uh, um, written on. I have them all linked uh, in the show notes. <coughs> um, so Christina says the things that she's learned or come to realize over 2019, she much prefers to spin her own prepped fiber from raw fleece over commercial. I think a lot of us would... Uh, agree with that. She learned to spin a consistent cotton yarn on a tackly spindle, which is amazing. Well done, Christina. She's spinning linen. It, spinning linen is a lot of work and it's hard on the fingers. Absolutely. I've learned to knit continental style. Well done. Perfect is the enemy of good. Absolutely. Spinning from the fold is the absolute best. So she really loves that. <clears throat> she saved all of her comb top, all of her combed waste to use for exhausting any leftover dye in the dye pot before tipping it out, which is a great idea. Guide hooks on the flyer on the flyer arm are easier to use and fill the bobbin more evenly than a yarn guide when you squeeze that you squeeze to move along, which is what I now have. <clears throat> Careful what you wish for, she says. I think when she's talking about the guide hooks, she's talking about the ones that are like screwed into the flyer arm versus the one that you squeeze and move along. <clears throat> Cause I know that she now has, I think, um, Christina, you have a Magicraft rose now, I think, I feel like. An automatic ins insect spray repellent is great for peace of mind against moths, especially if you have lots of fiber or raw fleece. Good point. Okay, so Megan says, you're in review, make 27. She did a lot in 2019 and it was a blast. Things that she learned, she got a floor loom and she wove on it. She became really good at top down sweaters for the first time. She'd always done them in pieces before or bottom up, but she really likes top down. She learned several new ways to pearl continental and really improved her ribbing. That's fantastic because often in beginner knitters, I know you're not a beginning knitter, Meg, but for beginning knitters, getting a really even rib, it can be challenging. She did her first tubular bind off. She spun 12 ounces of cable yarn for a vest, which was the first large structured yarn spin. That's amazing. And her 51 yarns, she finished year one of groups A with group A and spun a lot of new yarns. That's wonderful. At the beginning of 2019, I made a list of 27 knitting projects. Out of these, I finished 14 of them, mostly garments. I have three active works in prog progress. Two that will go on my list for next year and six that I decided to scrap. That is not bad. I agree with you, uh, uh, Megan. She also spun it and wove and sewed many projects. Rebecca, Rebby J, says, Great idea, Imoni, and thanks for the invitation to post. I did a long reflection in a blog post yesterday, but I'll sum it up into nine points. So uh, Rebecca has a blog um, Osborne, um, Rebecca, I know you're in the chat today, which is so great to see you. Maybe you, um, can, uh, just link your, your blog, um, in the chat if you, if you'd like to. She made seven sweaters, four entirely by hand and three partially by machine. She still has lots to learn about fit. Swatches lie, even big ones properly blocked and weighted. And there's no swatch like the first five inches of a sweater. Learn to expect to rip. Absolutely. We talk about that on the podcast all the time. It's okay to relax and go with my gut. I can't account for all variables and there is no such thing as over planning. Look for that balance between intentionally, intentionality and instinct. This requires peaceful attention, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna come back to that one. Knitting machines are awesome, are amazing. I have lots of questions about them. I started weaving on a rigid head loom and love it. It fits in this stage of my life in a way that nothing else does. I kept up almost with the 51 yarns. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it to me to do all the sampling and documentation. And she's looking forward to year two. She started monthly reflection blog posts, which are helpful. I look forward to them every month. That's awesome. Um, I can be multi craft jewel. Think in seasons. Thanks to Felicia. Felicia through the School of Sweet Georgia does um, 
her podcast or her, she calls it a vlog, her weekly vlog on Fridays called Taking Back Friday. And she talks a lot about the seasons of craft. So for her, she does a lot of her dyeing in the summer when she can be outside and when she can um, uh, sort of do that messy work that needs to be done sort of in a, in a larger outdoor space. And then in the winter, she does a lot of weaving and a lot of work up in her attic because in the summer it gets really hot. Um, so she talks about, you know, the idea of being multicraftual, but then also um, thinking in terms of seasons and that these different um, uh, uh, crafts that we do, these different hobbies that we do sort of fit into these different seasons of life. And I, to I think it's just a wonderful way of looking at it. Um, her vlog, Taking Back Friday, is on YouTube, so you can uh, search that. I love crafting with and for my kids. That's where all the spontaneity in my crafting comes from, and that's awesome. Homemaking is a creative practice, absolutely. And while it's not usually my favorite, it's very rewarding when I give it some respect. That's very true, Rebecca. I remember when my mom, <clears throat> when I was first home, so it wasn't after James was born, but it was very much after Nora was born. I was really struggling with being at home with two kids. And my mom said to me, it was very, at the time it felt very profound. But she said, because um, we, when when my brother and I were, were the ages that my kids were at that time, so sort of one and a half in a newborn, we were living in a very isolated area up in Northern British Columbia. And so my mom couldn't just pop out to things like Strong Start or Tot Romp or the library or like everything took a lot of planning. And she had a 30 minute drive to get to any type of a city center, let alone like the outside of a city center, you know? So um, she said to me that, uh, you know, being at home with young children and being at home because you're choosing to be at home and because you have time to do what you want to do are two very different things. And it was a real aha moment for me because Nora was only a few weeks old. And um, I remember sort of think, seeing her thinking and listening to what she was saying and thinking, yeah, you're absolutely right. And so, you know, embracing that homemaking is, can, be, can be challenging. Um, okay, so Kat says, and I think Kat might be in the chat. I thought I saw her, maybe not. If you're here, hi Kat. Um, Kat says, 2019 was an interesting year for me. My job took a lot more time and energy than it had done in a long time, which is mostly good, but sometimes a bit frustrating as it leaves little room for the amount of crafting I'd like to do. I think we all can, uh, can sympathize with that, Kat, for sure. So she says, bus knitting is awesome and it's rekindled my love of sewing, of knitting seamed sweaters so they stay portable. That's that's a great, um, a really good point, actually. I think um, Jenny of Tiny Paper Foxes, um, she used to say that when she was commuting um, in and out of New York before they moved to their farm. I can sew knitted sweaters together by machine. Consider my mind blown. That is such a cool thing to learn. Working from raw fleece is amazing and the variety one can get is brilliant. So this is interesting to me because this came up several times in what people were reflecting on in terms of what they um, learned this year was more and more people were really enjoying the process of working from the raw. I wish our breed and color studies could be from the raw, but of course shipping raw fleece around the world is just not realistic. Um, so I love it when people join our breed and color studies using a raw fleece and reflecting on that process because the rest of us get a chance to learn and it empowers those who don't necessarily have the confidence yet to work from raw fleece because they can see how it worked for somebody else, which is great. Commercial top totally has its place. Uh, see the bit about time above, but choose carefully. Absolutely. I love spinning very fine. Who knew? Crazy Art Yarn makes great accents in weaving. I totally agree. So would Imani. Um, I spent a week at Guild Summer School learning techniques for the Rigid Heddle Loom, and it was absolutely fabulous and so inspiring. Sewing with hand spun, hand woven is all I expected it to be. Want to do more of it? I think there's many of us in this community who are very inspired by those who are sewing with their hand spun and hand woven that want to do more of that. So you've got lots of support here, Kat. And she added a late entry. I've avoided spinning alpaca fleece pure because I find it annoying to prep. Turns out it doesn't need much prep. Pulling it apart with my fingers and spinning it from the cloud works just fine. That's wonderful. And then she finished off with what an interesting little exercise is often. I thought I'd, I don't have nine things, but then had to pick my favorites as I thought of more things. Thank you to Emily and to myself. So that's great. 
<clears throat> I'm still, um, I'm still fighting my cold. I'm feeling way better, but um, the kids got quite sick after Christmas, and we uh, unfortunately sort of have been under the weather since. So the kids have basically been sick for the whole holiday, but it has forced us to stay home and have some really super quiet days, movies and popcorn, um, which has actually been really nice, I have to say. <laughs> Sharon, spinning is the hardest thing to learn. Yeah, I don't know though the we the the uh, the learning curve with weaving be uh, shaft shaft loom weaving, it's pretty steep too. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree, Elizabeth. Raw fleece is so rewarding. Scouring long wools is a little easier than fine. Absolutely. Yeah, you have so much. I totally agree, Elizabeth, that you have more control. So I did mine. Um, and as you can see, my grid here. I am going to post this on Instagram a little bit later. Um, I. I really felt like um, 2019 was, you know, while it was a hard year, um, there was a lot of really great things about 2019. Um, in 2019, of course, um, we lost my dad and we also lost my dog, Charlotte. Um, so it was sort of a, a, a sad year in, in a lot of ways. But then in a lot of other ways, um, this community grew like exponentially. I just couldn't, I just can't get over how much this community has grown. Um, I Some of my friendships that, I had always considered to be good friendships really blossomed into very close friendships and people that um, have always sort of been there and been, um, you know, friends really became solid support network, you know, best friends kind of thing. And that that was really, really wonderful. Um, so I sat down and did my nine and I was surprised at how much happened this year so because I did kind of start off by listing the things that that happened like that got done so these are mine um I made 29 items in 2019 including five sweaters four pairs of socks seven shawls which I thought was really interesting because remember that sparks of gray the one that I that I call my my prayer shawl my death shawl that I made when my dad was so sick that took forever so the fact that I still was able to make seven shawls just kind of blew my mind I made five wo woven blankets or stoles because that was when I my friend Jeanette lent me my the Jane loom, the Luet Jane, and then I transitioned to the Leclerc 45 inch jack floor loom. I made lots of tea towels off of three warps. I made two bath sheets off of one warps one warp and then a couple of miscellaneous items. I finished 23 spinning projects in 2019, including two sweater spins, three sock yarn spins, and five textured yarns, and then I did lots of samples. Um, I thought I had spun a lot more sock yarn, interestingly enough, <clears throat> but when I looked back, all of that content that I made for uh, the School of Sweet Georgia and for us, for the woolen spinning community, a lot of those yarns were actually spun in 2019. So I ended up only actually still having four pairs, which is still a lot of pairs of socks, but four pairs were actually knit this year, only four pairs. Whereas in 2019, I think I knit like nine or 10 pairs of socks. So yeah, it kind of puts it in perspective. Um, I learned to weave on a floor loom and how to read a draft, which was um, just mind boggling to me. That was a lifelong dream that I was able to realize this year. I completed the first half of the 51 yarn spin along that we began in a community in January of 2019. So that was something that I had sort of figured I may or may not make all of the yarns, then I may use some yarns as examples. But I ended up spinning all of them, which is really cool. <clears throat> I recorded a lot of live streams and many podcast episodes, including the Woolen Spinning radio episodes with Katrina, who is obviously one of my one of my people. Um, I Katrina and I completed Unbraided, The Art and Science of Spinning Color. So we wrote our first book together, which was amazing. I completed two workshops for the School of Sweet Georgia, the Spin to Knit a Sweater and the Spin to Knit Socks workshops. Um, and then I wrote that there's a lot of sadness this year that threatened to overshadow the good things that were happening around me. While my dad went through his initial workup, he insisted that we go on our amazing trip to the Yukon. And in the end, the trip ended up being a pilgrimage for me to where I grew up, the houses we lived in, and showing the kids that, and showing the kids that, and visiting my grandmother. So the photo, it's number six. It's the second one. It's the one in the middle at the top next to, sorry, I'm trying to get the camera right here. It's the one uh, right here next to me and Katrina. That's where my grandmother is buried outside of Dawson Creek, British Columbia, which is way up north. Um, in knitting, the 
the project that I'm most proud of is my Marie Chen, which is right next to that photo of uh, Maud. And if you actually look at the gravestone, this is a little bit morbid, but if you look at the gravestone, you can see that little bit of pink next to my uh, right shoulder next, because I'm wearing my throwback cardigan. And if you look down at, um, yeah, right that Nora had laid a whole bunch of little flowers along because we didn't bring flowers with us because it's a cemetery that doesn't, um, uh, everybody there is buried and it doesn't, it's not like maintained um, because of their winters. And so they come and cut the grass, but that's it. So we didn't want to leave flowers in, ca in case like the wrapping and stuff be didn't, um, like ended up creating litter. So anyhow, um, Nora went around the cemetery and got all these like little weeds and she put them along the, the grave. Uh, in spinning, I am most proud of my boucle yarn that I made for December's 51 yarn spin along. That was something that I've always wanted to do. A hand spun binder, a hand spun uh, core yarn, and a hand spun boucle. And the whole thing was hand spun and I'm most proud of that yarn. And that's that green yarn uh, right here. Um, and then I'm very proud of the countless hours of content, PDF downloads, and blog posts for both WellforPearls.com and Patreon. I think that the... Um, I wasn't really sure what that would all look like and how that would grow the community. And I sort of had these ideas in my mind and these things that I wanted to hit. But um, to sort of sit back and go through all of that and look at all of that, I'm, I'm really proud of all of that. So, all right. What is the bottom left picture? So the bottom left, the one that's the, it's editing software. So that's actually number nine is all of the editing and all the video editing and all of the uh, time that I spent on the computer because I see all of that work as so incredibly creative. Um, I think that's why it really resonated with me, the comment above about, um, if I can find it. Hang on. Um, that you had said, Rebecca, about um, the monthly yeah, you started monthly reflection blog posts that were helpful and she looks forward to them every month. I see that time that, you know, at first I thought that digital content creation and stuff would feel very uh, sterile because you're like on the computer and you're doing this type of work. And I was worried that it wouldn't feel particularly uh, creative over time. And that's actually, it's been the opposite. It's actually fueled my creativity in a way that I never thought that I, it would. And photography is still not my absolute most favorite thing to do, but my photography has continued to improve. Um, I enjoy it now. I like reading blog posts from, from other photographers. I pick Katrina's brain sometimes, and if Eric's around, I'll pick his brain sometimes. Not to take advantage of them, but just to like ask them for, for um, you know tips and tricks around s specific things. And, um, all those little things have really made a big difference in terms of my own creativity, where if I can't get on my wheel or I can't grab my knitting and, and do my knitting for a couple of days because it's just too busy or whatever, um, this stuff is actually very creative and really fuels my creativity. And the more I do of it, the more I want to do, which is really cool. <clears throat> mm. Don't worry, Diane, I'm making myself tired too. I, uh, some, sometimes with this stuff, I, um, I sometimes wonder like how I, like how I get it all done. Cause I sleep like 10 hours a night. Like, it's not like I stay up late. I sleep a lot. The new issue of spinoff magazine is out. Um, this is the winter 2020 and there is a review at the very front of the book. I'll put it down here. I just have to move my hiss up. Um, there's a review of the book included in the uh, magazine. And thank you to the people at, at uh, Spinoff for um, such a kind review. Um, that was really nice of you. And if you haven't seen this issue, uh, please, please make sure you pick it up. It's funny, Joanna. So she feels like, man, I, I feel like I got nothing done. I think when I first saw that um, the prompt and I saw people starting to post like what they had done and whatnot, I was sitting there going, oh my goodness, I've done nothing. Like I didn't knit any sweaters this year and blah, blah, blah. And then you start looking at like, I think that's where keeping your, your project page on Ravelry up to date, both your hand spun page and your um, uh, project page, just spending that time, you know, once, once a week or once every couple of weeks 
and trying to keep it up to date even if it's just phone photos and you're just plugging them in just to put a photo to the project I think you'll be surprised how much you actually do get done it's really quite amazing yeah, I haven't gotten my ply issue either. Um, it's always so delayed getting getting to Canada. And I talked to JC about it because um, I had lost it. There, they, it, a few issues over time hadn't been mailed to me. And she said there's always just a big delay for, for those of us in Canada. Um, let's talk about my hyssop. So I have made huge progress on this shawl. And the yarn is very dark, so it's very difficult to really show you guys like a really great um, sort of view of this shawl. Because when I put it down, it's just it's just dark. It's a dark logwood logwood uh, color, so you can see how how dark that is. So I'm I'm I can't really fix it because it's the yarn. Um, I have made some big progress and I'm actually down to the last two balls. So what I decided to do in the end, because I, I modified the pattern from an Aran weight. I've talked about this on the show before. I modified the pattern from an Aran weight, which is how the pattern is written on five and a half millimeter needles. And I modded it down on my, I actually got um, a set of interchangeable chow goose. Finally, I've been really wanting a pair and I, treated myself at Knit City, or yeah, at Knit City. Um, so I modded it down to four millimeter needles. And <clears throat> I'm basically going to, so I'm not, I'm just ignoring the stitch counts in the pattern because um, this, my shawl is just gonna be smaller. Uh, basically, when I run out of yarn for this ball, all I have left are these two. So when I run out of yarn for this, I'm going to start the garter border, which goes around all three sides. So you knit the lace first. Maybe it's better if I show it to you guys on the big camera up here and I can hold it up. So this is it here. So you start at the bottom. You can see the tail hanging off. And you knit upwards and you increase on every single row except for two rows. And basically, I'm going to drape it on my dress form. There we go. That's better. Yeah, that's better. Kind of. Now it's just small. Just bear with me here. Um, so, I... There we go. So I, um, you start from down here and you knit upward. And then when you get to that point up here where you finish the last um, repeat of the chart, and the chart is really easy to memorize. I actually haven't been carrying it around with me, the book, because the book is quite significant. It's by Layla Raven. And the uh, book is called To The Point. The knitted triangle and it's this I've shown this on the podcast before so I won't spend too too much time on this showing you guys what this is but just for those of you who aren't caught up on the podcast episodes if you've missed the last couple it's this shawl here So basically what you do is once you finish knitting the body of the shawl, you keep these stitches active and they become your garter stitches. And then you pick up along here and you pick up along here and you knit your garter stitch border. So what I'm going to do is knit until I run out of yarn and I'll report back to let you know if this even works. It might not work at all. Um, I'm going to knit until I run out of yarn and then um, this will be my garter border and I'll knit until I run out of yarn. So my garter border may end up being narrower than the sample or it may end up being thicker. I suspect it will be narrow, narrower or about the same. Um, but I have to make sure that I have enough to cast off because you've got to go all the way around the shawl. And the shawl is going to be a fairly significant size. Like even though um, I modified this to this yarn, which is... I think it's 14 wraps per inch was what I figured out. And so that's why I chose the four millimeter needles because it's about a uh, sport weight. And 
I liked the fabric that I got when I tried the four millimeter needles. So I actually didn't even try anything else. I just went with the four millimeter needles. Um, yeah, and then I'll, I'll um, I just have to make sure that I stop knitting so that I have enough yarn to cast off because um, that's fairly significant to go all the way around. So I'm really enjoying this. When I first started it, the, up to about here, so from here to here, I wasn't really enjoying it a ton. Um, and wrapping all of these stitches was really, it was pretty intense. But now that I've kind of figured out how to do it in a way that's speeds me up a little bit. And I shared that in the last episode in episode 131 um, and it's timestamped. So just look on YouTube down below and you can see the timestamp and you can scroll through to where I talk about this project. Um, it's really sped me up. And because I've got the lace pattern memorized now, um, cause it's over eight rows, I think, or maybe 10 rows. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, it's quite fast. It's very like, it's, it's good knitting. So I'm just reading the comments in the chat. You guys, you guys are just amazing. When people are really talking um, and answering to one and answering one another and, and chatting and whatnot, I find um, I find it really um, it, when I'm actually like doing the podcast, I can't read everything and, and keep up. But I just love that you guys chat so so beautifully with one another that you guys want to chat with each other and that you uh, answer each other's questions. It's just amazing. So Kelly, let's talk about swatching for a sweater. So I have kind of come to some of the same conclusions that Rebecca has come to about swatching. Um, the last few sweaters, I've done a gauge swatch, but I haven't actually measured it or taken it into account particularly um, because I find it's just not, for, for myself, it's just not that accurate. And I've knit enough sweaters and I know how yarn sort of tends to act and how it grows and how you can manipulate it in the washing process that you can sort of get it to do what you want it to do. So I talked about this on the wool stream. I just have to grab my bag. So I talked about this on the wool stream and uh, this is the Copenhagen. And I think I have a photo of it before we get into talking about the project. So let me just move forward. So this is the Copenhagen cardigan and my friend Mari and I had seen it at Knit City back in October and I talked about it quite a bit. And I went ahead and swatched for it. So remember back in October, when I was first talking about this project, um, the plan was to spin all of the Falkland that I had bought from West Coast Color. And it was all these different colors of sort of browns and yellows and sort of tawny browns. Um, there was some undyed fiber. And then from Farmer's Daughter Yarns, I had bought some silk mohair. So this is all balled up. This is one of the two skeins. And um, I'm not sure if the yarn was stored damp or what happened, but the yarn got really, really smelly throughout the uh, month of October and into November. So I left the yarn in the skeins rather than winding it up. And as I finished the spin, the Falkland spin, I ended up um, washing the farmer's daughter yarn and it came out okay. I think um, it doesn't it doesn't smell anymore quite to the same extent. And this was my knitted swatch, which there is a photo of it there. But the idea was based on the sample that me and Mari had seen was that I would hold one strand of my hand spun and one strand of the um, mohair silk words, Rachel. So um, I did that in the sample because remember I oh, so on the wool stream because we talked about capsule wardrobe in the wool stream. And uh, so I had talked in the wool stream and I'm not sure if I mentioned on the podcast or not, but I had talked I had mentioned that I wasn't really sure. <coughs> excuse me, sorry, that that based on the results of the yarn that I was really that happy with it and that I really wanted to pursue my original plan. So I decided in the end, and this is what I shared on the wool stream, that I was going to swatch 
and I did swatch and I shared this and I actually was really, really happy with the results. And so I decided to go ahead and I had already bought the pattern anyways. So I decided to go ahead and start knitting and I balled up two. I had the original um, balled up yarn that I had done the sample from, the, the swatch. I didn't actually measure this. I don't actually know what my gauge is at all. Um, I didn't I didn't measure it. And then I have the second ball of yarn. This is 306, 36 yards, I think. And I've been alternating. So let me pop this down here so that you can still see the sample. And then you guys can see. So I was knitting like crazy this morning. You guys would totally laugh at me because I um, um, was in the middle of the short rows back here. And so to shape for the, to lift up the back neck. And um, I said to Mike, to my husband, I was like, I can't really talk about this on the podcast because I'm like in the middle of a row. And he like laughed, he laughed at me. He's like, well, you got three hours to uh, get to the end of a row. So I finished all of the short rows. So this is what it's looking like thus far. And it's quite stripey. Um, I knew that it would be, but I think what's good about it. So nobody's gonna be looking at my the back of my collar because my hair will be in the way. So that'll hide that sort of that brighter yellow in there. But as you look down here, it becomes quite tonal. Um, and it, it just, it kind of looks like the Malabrigo type yarns that are tonal and there's movement and there's interest. And the, holding it with the mohair um, makes the stitches kind of fuzzy. So the stitches become, like they're not um, as defined anymore. And so when Mari and I were talking about this at Knit City and we we're kind of debating about the fiber that I should buy and the, the silk mohair that I should buy, we were both saying in some ways it kind of doesn't matter because the stitches become quite fuzzy and ill-defined, which is part of the reason why I was starting to think, well, maybe I shouldn't make this because all that hand spun and all that time is gonna get kind of lost in the sweater itself. But then on the other hand, the colors are exactly what I like to wear. Um, it has such a nice feel and a nice look to it. And if I'm gonna wear it, then maybe that outweighs the loss, if you will, of showcasing the yarn. Um, so maybe instead of showcasing the the yarn itself, this time I'm actually showcasing what the yarn is capable of and how far you can push it when you put it with sort of a commercial yarn or when you put it with um, something else. And because I'm doing two by two striping, so I'm, you know, two rows, two rows, two rows, and I'll keep doing that through the whole cardigan. Um, you know, you you can end up with sort of this very tonal, very and there's no there's no patterning in this cardigan. There's no um, as you can see, like there's no when it flips over, there's no cables or lace or anything like that. And as you're knitting down the front button band, you're actually knitting the button band as you go, and then you make afterthought buttonholes. So there's no there's nothing to kind of detract or distract from the colors in the yarn. Um, and so I think, you know, to that, in that vein and to that, to that sort of, res, you know, effect, I'm gonna keep on going. Um, I chose to cast on the size small. I may have to rip back and I may have to redo it. But the thing is, is like, this is on a dress form. This is the collar. Um, so like it, it is right. Cause remember our knitting grows so substantially when you wash it and I'm not ever going to wear a cardigan that cinched up like that. So adding a whole bunch of ease and making a significantly bigger, like the, another size up, um, it's not necessarily what I want to wear is something sort of that tight or sorry, that loose because I find because of my shoulders, because of my um, this is getting into like, like fit and physicality. And we've talked about this a lot on the podcast. Everybody's different. Everybody's body is different. Everybody's shape and what they need is different. But the space for me from my shoulders, um, up to my neck, um, this area here is quite overdeveloped. And so I find if it's too loose and if it's too big, it literally just kind of falls off me. Um, and so I find if I have a slightly smaller 
neck opening up here and then I give myself ample room in the yoke. So even if I make it bigger than what is called for in the pattern and I give myself a solid eight inches from the underarm up to the collarbone of space in the sweater, not because my measurement is eight inches, it's more like six and a half. But if this is eight inches, um, that gives me lots and lots of space. And then you can have your first button here, but you're not ever really gonna do that up. You maybe you're gonna do these buttons if you're gonna wear it buttoned, but you've given yourself enough ease to be able to do that. So that's a nice thing about top-down cardigans like this or top-down sweaters. You can modify them so that they fit your requirements and your needs, if that makes sense. I'm also finding too, um, that because my shape has changed quite a bit in the last year, year and a half, um, basically since I made the commitment to um, all of the lifestyle changes and whatnot that I started back in the winter of uh, 20, 2016, I guess it was, um, because my shape has continued to change, I don't want to deviate too, too much from the shape and the measurements that have really worked well for the last couple of cardigans. Because the Malabrigo cardigan, and actually I think I took it off, so I'll add it really quick. The Malabrigo cardigan that I made recently, um, I made it while we were away. <clears throat> um, what was it called? Lady Marple. The funny thing is, it's not my colors at all. Um, and yet the funny thing is, is that I've actually worn it a ton, which is kind of funny. So it'll come up next. This, I've worn this a ton. Um, and it's not, it's totally not my colors, but the fit was right. Um, and again, I had enough space um, in the yoke to make it work. So yeah. Okay, let me catch up with chat because you guys are... That would be amazing, Jessica, if you were able to do your first sweater spin this year. That would be great. There's the hashtag sweater spin in um, the channel, sweater spin in the Slack channel. So if you're looking for support, um, do go in there. <laughs> yeah, Rebecca hates stopping in the middle of short roads. Yes, they're so frustrating. And these were Japanese short roads. So part of the problem was that you've got um, markers hanging off the backside. So um, it does get to be a bit messy. And then you've got like needles halfway through and needles coming across the front. I just didn't see how I was would be able to show you guys. Um, even now it's sort of annoying because I've got the lengthener in here to, to be able to show you guys sort of this laying out and, and what it looks like. Because if I take it off and I show you, this is how it's knitting up. So it's quite pretty. It's very soft. I'm actually surprised at how soft it is. But you can see how tonal it is. Um, I can't remember her first name. I It might be Sarah. I think it's Sarah. In the Ravelry group, she had shared um, back, it was a while ago, um, a sweater that was very, very similar to this. And I talked about it. Um, I feel like I talked about it on the podcast. I don't think it was a spinning growth. I think it was something else. Anyhow, her sweater um, that was very similar in color. It wasn't straight. It, she didn't include the mohair, but it was those same colors that I love so, so, so much. And I guess I'm kind of hoping that in some ways this will turn out uh, like similarly because hers was very tonal and it had that kind of Malabrigo yarn kind of look um and I really loved it it was very it really looked a lot like this minus the fuzziness of the stitches from the mohair being knit in there ah that is so true Diane short rows you know exactly what you're doing until you suddenly have no idea where you are and then you take your eyes off it for a second and boom confusion it's true because you don't know which way you're going if you don't just work through them and there's a lot of short rows in this I was actually kind of surprised because I'm used to patterns that are written with like maybe eight rows of sh eight short rows and this was more than double so very different from what I'm used to 
Suzanne, I legit want to pet that sweater. Trust me, it is so soft between the Falkland and the mohair. But the funniest thing is because of the silk mohair, it's got this really weird sheen to it now. I don't know if I'll ever be able to capture it on camera, but um, it is pretty cool. I have to say it is a pretty cool sweater. Um, I'm very happy with it thus far. Okay, let's move into weaving and then we're gonna say goodbye because we're almost at an hour mark. So my goal for um, the end of the year was to um, try to dress both of the looms. I'm just gonna get this stuff out of the way because it's getting really tangled and I don't want to um, finish the stream and then spend the rest of the day untangling silk and mohair. Um, I know you guys understand because that is a real problem. Because um, <clears throat> I'll just end up with a huge, huge, huge mess on my hands. <coughs> Sorry for the coughing. Um, I'm actually feeling really good. Uh, it's just this like lingering cough. And we had Nora looked at on Monday. I took, I never take the kids to the doctor ever. Um, and I actually did take her on Monday because I was quite worried about her. She was really uh, lethargic and she just wasn't herself at all. And um, we're pretty sure it's just viral, but um, the kids were exposed uh, accidentally and unfortunately um, to uh, strep throat over the holiday. And so um, I wanted to get her swabbed just in case and my GP agreed with me about that. So we swabbed her. I, I'm pretty sure it's negative. We haven't heard back probably here tomorrow or Friday. And, um, but she just wasn't herself. And, um, and then I've got the ling lingering cough and so does uh, James. So I decided in a moment of craziness that I was going to um, dress both looms that I wanted to get them dressed by the end of the year. So I have um, on the jack, it's the, the warp's not on yet. I'm hoping that my husband and I can get it on today. Um, is a black and white, or sorry, a, a red and white stripe, um, striped warp um, of four threads by four threads. So four, four cream, four red, four cream, four red. And that's, that's this one here actually. And this warp is going to be, um, they're actually going to be Christmas gifts for next year, although I'm going to keep a couple of them. It's going to be um, Hound's Tooth, um, which is a, a four shaft weaving draft. And then this draft, this warp was sort of a pseudo rainbow sort of, um, I wanted it to be a little bit gray, a little bit kind of um, atypical of sort of a, a, a true rainbow. And I wanted to do the same um draft and the same patterning so four threads uh four threads in the weft four threads in the warp um weaving at 18 ends per inch um so that i could kind of compare the two so houndstooth is is just two by two twelve uh two two twelve and um you can see how it almost is working up like a faux plaid kind of and the, the twill pattern there's two threads that travel across two warp threads and vice versa and um, the warp was actually really fast to make because even though you're winding each thread um, one by one, um, because you're working through an 11 color rainbow, um, and I'll show you guys here. I know the I can make this a little bit bigger for those who are watching on smaller devices. Um, this was sort of how I did the colors. And so I have my, my, my 11 colors in order that I wanted to do. And I, I did a whole bunch of different um, variations and I kept playing around with the colors and sort of changing changing it up and I had stumbled on these um pinwheel eight shaft um towels and I was really inspired by the colors that she used but I wanted to make a few changes and um yeah we I've ended up sort of with this like asymmetrical plaid sort of thing going on and um because I'm doing them at eight and they're gonna be a whole bunch of towels so the um, hems are going to be plain weave. So I've le left myself an inch and a half and I'll, th there'll be an inch and a half at the other end and they will be all different colors. That part will be all different colors. And, um, I'm just weaving away. So that's kind of what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, I really, really like how, so when I, 
I did, what was it? It was seven repeats. I ended up with nine repeats of the rainbow on these ones. And, um, and then I made sure that I started and ended with the white, which is actually kind of more of like a cream. And um, I really, I found when I was um, threading, because the Jack Loom has a dummy warp on it right now, which I'll take photos of and talk about next show. But this on the compact, I, did, I, I was just warping back to front and I had to thread all of the heddles. Um, because of the nine repeats of the color, I found that threading went so fast because you're just doing one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And because you've got four threads and they come off the cross in order, um, it was just so fast. Like there was no managing threads or dealing with anything. And every, sing every and you kind of work through one repeat of the color and then you're 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 done. So then you do another one. Well, now you've only got seven left. And then you do another one, you've only got six left. Like it was so fast. I think I threaded it within like two hours. It was so fast. And then slaying the reed, unfortunately, I did mess up at one point. I don't know how I messed up, but I got a couple of the threads twisted. So the first three or four inches of the warp um, as I started weaving was sort of fixing all of that, which was fine. Um, but I was a little bit bummed about that. The only thing is that because of the amount of color changes in this weaving, it's going to take forever to finish. Um, it's going to be a very labor intensive project. But on the other hand, it's really effective. It's really pretty. Um, these towels are going to pretty much be for us. I might give away one or two, um, but they'll be pretty much for our home. There are the colors that are in our house, the blue, the yellow, um, the brown. It's all they're all colors that are in our house. So yeah, really happy with them. Our house is very fall. Um, we have lots of, lots of natural, we have a lot of wood in our home. Um, we're actually selling all of our furniture, but the furniture that we're replacing it with is very similar um, in terms of the colors. Uh, it's just smaller because our house is not very big and our furniture is just too big for the space. It's stuff that we had from our condo. And our condo was just nine foot ceilings. You needed just bigger furniture. And then we moved to our house and it's like, oh yeah, we can totally make this work. But now it's time to, it's been almost 11 years and it's just time to move some stuff along. But the colors are still my favorite colors. So that okra, yellow, browns, um, that antique pink, um, and then the navy blues and the, and the sort of grays. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, autumn with a touch of cool gray, totally. I think it's okay to take on some of these more intense projects, you know, like that weaving there that's on the screen right now, that was all I did yesterday. Like that was sort of the little chunk that I did. So if these towels take sort of some time into the spring, like I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, it's intense every four threads changing colors and stuff and it might get old, but I, I'm, I'm such a process person that like I'm okay with that, you know, because I'm so happy with them and I love the colors so much. And it's just two, two twills. So once you get into the rhythm and I've got the treadle set up so that I can walk. So it's like one, uh, so I'm, I start on treadle three. So it's three, five, two, four. And then you go back again and like you're just walking you know, and it's just so rhythmic. So yeah, you're changing color, but as long as you have the next shuttle there ready to go, um, cause I've got all my shuttles out. I have from getting the Jack, she had a whole bunch of shuttles and then I already had two. This blue one was a gift at Christmas time. Um, it's the Shacked 20 year anniversary, no 50 year anniversary in the blue. It's the 50 years, the Shacked spindle which was, it's the mini, I think it's the 11 inch, um, which is just awesome. I love that. I love that shuttle. I would love to get another one. That's the bigger one, the 15 inch. And, um, and then Kay had a whole bunch of shuttles that came with her loom. And then the compact came with a couple. So I basically put a bobbin in every single shuttle and I just keep them lined up. So anyhow, are you carrying the wefts up the side? Um, I'm not Suzanne because there's 11 colors. So the floats would be way too long in the red towels. I'm going to carry the weft up the side. Um, and I have salvage threads on each side on both of the warps. Um, and then on 
they, these towels, I'm not carrying the weft. On the red and white ones, I will be carrying the weft. So, yeah. Course by course, you can enjoy it. Yeah, and the other thing too is because the hem area, so on this one, the first one, the hem is navy blue. And what I'm gonna do is change the hem color on it, all of them. So they'll all be different hem colors. So this one will be navy blue on each end. Another one will be brown on each end. Another one will be white on each end. So just kind of keep it varied that way. <clears throat> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna salvage the edges, not hem them. Yeah, yeah. I thought that for these ones that would be um, the easiest thing to do, and then I'll hem the top and bottom. Yeah, so the other ones I might hem the sides. I'm not sure yet. It depends on how they turn out, to be honest. I may hem these ones only on the sides, only because there are so many colors being carried up, so many colors on each side that I may hem them. Um, I'm just gonna see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. I'll report back. All right, um, I wanna wish everybody a really, really happy new year. I hope that you have some plans for 2020. I don't know, some of you probably are into setting goals. Some of you probably aren't. Um, some probably have resolutions and stuff that you guys have set for, for the new year. Um, so whatever that looks like, I hope that um, you're sort of making plans around that kind of stuff. I think my major um, goals for 2020 or plans for 2020 is to make a couple of things to add to my capsule wardrobe to continue to clean out um, clothes that I don't wear anymore and to pare down. Um, and then I'd really like to get more comfortable with floor loom weaving and make some more complicated projects. I'm thinking really seriously about upgrading the compact from four shaft to eight shaft because it's a kit that you can buy. Um, I'm just so that I'll have one eight shaft loom and one four shaft loom but I'll keep you posted because I, I haven't made any decisions yet. Um, hopefully by next episode or maybe the episode after, I'll have a really, um, I'll have a, an announcement um, um, to make and maybe an unboxing, which would be really fun. And so stay tuned for that. And uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful New Year's Day and the show will be released publicly on Friday around 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So look forward to that. Show notes will be available, are available to patrons now. And I will do the timestamps later today so that you guys can access different uh, parts of the show very quickly. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you for spending so much time with me. And until next time, happy spinning, happy weaving, happy knitting. Happy all the things and happy new year. Bye guys.